Hello, welcome back to physics. We're going to be learning something really important in this lesson. We're going to learn how to add two vectors graphically together. So in the last section, we introduced what was a scalar, just a number. What is a vector? A, a number with a direction. That's what a vector quantity. And we said that we represent vectors as arrows. The length of the arrows, how intense or how strong or the magnitude of the vector. And of course, the direction the arrow's pointing is which way the thing is acting. But in physics, we're going to be doing problems all the time where we have to add vectors together. Maybe I'm pushing on a box with a force, which we now know is a vector, and then I have another force acting at an angle, which is separately acting from like a separate person, so he's pushing down. So we have two forces acting on the box. So clearly, if we want to figure out how the box moves, we have to add the forces together somehow, or, or at least it's helpful to be able to add the forces. But the problem is vectors are not just numbers. They're numbers along with direction. So to add them together is not the simple matter of just adding the numbers because how do you, you have to take into account the direction uh, that the things are acting on. And so we have a graphical method actually drawing pictures to add vectors together graphically. But as I said in the last section, we're going to spend a lot of time on vector addition graphically next couple of lessons. And then a couple of lessons later, I'm going to kind of show you how to add vectors together that you don't need to draw any pictures or any graphical arrows to do it. So we're learning two ways. This one's kind of to give you that intuitive feel to understand what's happening, but then just kind of keep in mind we're going to slowly phase out the graphical um, method of adding vectors when we actually solve lots and lots of problems. But don't skip this section. It's very important for you to understand what's going on here. Um, the easiest way to show how to add vectors is to show some simple examples that you already know the answers to because you all have experience with vectors because we live on Earth and we have vectors all around us, um, but you probably just haven't you know, thought much about, about it. So here we have a box, and you know, we use lots of boxes in physics, and I have two vectors acting on this box. The first vector is called F1, vector quantity. That's why I have an arrow on top. That's a force. I'm pushing on this box to the right, okay? And then a second person is standing right next to me, also pushing on the box. Now, I have to draw the arrows kind of separate, but you, you can think about us pushing on this box from the same central, central point on the box. You can think of it that way. But anyway, this vector is called F sub 2, and it's a vector quantity, so I draw it with an arrow on top. Now notice right away, the arrows are the same length, so I'm, at, I'm already telling you without even knowing anything. I haven't written down how many newtons of force is here. It, it doesn't really matter for the graphical method. But what you know is that these arrows are the same length, so you know that we're both pushing with the same amount of force. I don't know, I haven't told you if it's 10 newtons or 6 newtons or 5 newtons, but you know that whatever it is, we're both pushing with the same force, right? Uh, and you also know that we're pushing in the same direction. Now, I had to draw the arrows slightly separated to, for clarity, but you can kind of think of us pushing at the same central point on the box, kind of one on top of each other. How would we add these vectors together? Well, you know from intuition that if I'm pushing this one with 10 newtons, let's say, and I'm pushing this one with 10 newtons, what's the total force on the box? What do you think it is? Well, it's 10 plus 10 is 20. If I push and then I have another hand and I push and we add the forces together. But here's the thing. The only reason you can really add those together like that is because these forces are acting in the same direction. So it makes sense to us that we add them together. Uh, but the reason you can do it so simply is because of that. So if we add these guys together, okay, and what we might say is we might say we're adding F1 as a vector, plus we're adding F2 as a vector. See how we have the vector arrows on top? So it tells you that we're adding vectors together. Then what's going to happen is we're going to have a box over here, and we want to add up and find out what the total force is. You know intuitively that it's this plus this, and so the total force acting on this box is going to be an arrow that's twice as long as the first one, like this, F1 plus F2. This is the what we call the resultant. We call that the resultant, FR, okay? So I tried to do my best. This is not quite right, but it's about maybe a little bit, a little bit too long. But anyway, this, and stack another one right on the end, it should be about equal to that. Intuitively, you know that because you know that when you push boxes with two people, then it ends up being pushed twice as hard. You know that. I'm starting with some very simple examples. So you know that you can add these arrows in certain ways. Now let's take a different um, example that's going to be a completely different result. We're going to use the same forces, F1 and F2, but in this case, the, we're going to apply them differently. Because you can't, in general, just add these vectors together with numbers because of the following thing. Let's say person number one, whoops, let's say person number one is pushing on this box, exact same force as before, 
So we'll call it F1. But then we have another person on the other side of the box pushing, but pushing against you. So this is F sub 2. What do you think is going to happen in this case? If I have a box and I'm pushing this way, and then I have another box and I'm pushing this way, and because the lengths of the arrows are the same, I'm trying to draw them the same, what's going to happen to the box? Well, you know from experience, if I'm pushing with the exact same force that I'm pulling, then, or I'm pushing against, then the box is going to stay here and there will be no, basically no arrow acting on it. So the resultant is basically equal to zero. Why? Because they canceled out. Because you see, it was still 10 newtons here, if, if we're going with numbers, right? It could be whatever. This was 10 newtons, let's just pretend this is 10 newtons. And this is still 10 newtons. But I'm proving to you by an example that you cannot just add vectors number to number. Because otherwise this would be 10 plus 10 is 20. But you now know that, no, no, the direction does matter. If I'm pushing and he's pushing, then the numbers were the same, but we didn't get 20, we got zero. Why? Because the directions were different. Because vectors are not just numbers, they're numbers with a direction. So when you add them, you can't just add the numbers together. You have to have a way to handle the directions. So these were very simple because they're easy to see. But I want to go and show you a method to add vectors together that works for these, okay? But also works if the vectors are not in these simple cases. Like what if they're in an angle or whatever? How do I add them together? How do I take into account the different magnitudes of the vectors and also their different directions? To find the resultant vector, that's what this is called, resultant, that means after I add them, what's the answer? That's what resultant vector means. How do I do it? First, before we jump into that, let me give you a couple of other examples that I think you can get the answers to without doing any math, without doing any actual um, you know, formal procedure. Let's give you a couple of things and just see if you can kind of predict what the vector addition might, might be. What if I have some ball or something right here, and let's say I'm acting on it with a force here that I'm calling F1, and on the same ball, I'm acting horizontally with another guy called F2. Now, these are 90 degrees apart, so I'm pushing up, and also my friend or whoever is standing next to me, also touching the ball, is pushing horizontally. What do you think is going to happen to a box or a crate? I'm pushing this way, and somebody underneath is pushing up. What's going to happen? Well, you kind of know that it's not just going to go up, and it's not just going to go this way. It's going to go at an exact angle kind of right between them. So if I do this, I'm going to end up pushing the thing this way. The force will be acting this way. So we're not going to get into too much detail, but I'm just proving to you that the resultant vector is going to end up looking something like this. Now, is the resultant vector twice as much as F1? No, not quite, because they're not lined up. But it is bigger than F1, and it is bigger than F2. Mostly don't worry so much about that. I mostly want you to realize that the direction of, of force is splitting the difference 45 degrees between them because these are exactly the same, but they're 90 degrees apart. So the resultant would look something like this. So let's take a very similar situation and say, what if I have that same exact thing, but instead of 90 degrees apart, what if I do it like this? What if this one, this person is acting with F1 at an angle, and then this guy is acting like this, F2 at an angle? What do you think is going to happen to that ball? Here's a ball, somebody's pushing this way, somebody's pushing this way, same forces. Well, this way, they're a little bit more lined up. F1 and F2 are getting closer to being totally in line like they were up here, but they're still par far apart. So you don't know maybe exactly what the force will be, but you know intuitively that the force is going to split the difference between these two vectors, something like this, resultant vector. Now, this one here, this vector here is bigger than this one. Why? Because F1 and F2 are closer to being lined up, so they're closer to being in the same direction. So think about you know, pulling a car with like two chains, and I'm pulling this way, and I'm pulling slightly different. As I bring the two chains closer to one another, and, and, and even if I hold these forces the same, then I'm going to get I'm going to be able to pull harder if I line them up. Here we're getting closer and closer, so this one's a little bit longer, but again, it's splitting the difference between these forces. Now let's take the extreme case. Let's say that I have this ball, and I act this way with it. Same force, actually I'm trying to draw the same force. I'm, sometimes I'm getting a little sloppy. And then here, very, very, very close to that guy, I have another force right here. So this is F1 and underneath it is F2. 
But notice how incredibly close together they are. What is going to happen? It's going to split the difference between them just like it did before, but these vectors are almost completely lined up. So this guy is going to be really close to two times the value. This is the resultant vector. So maybe this one was a little bit too long. I'm not sure. I'm not doing the actual math and I'm not trying to be too rigorous about it. What I'm trying to show you is when they're 90 degrees apart, they, it splits the difference in the angle, but it's since they're being pulled so differently, it's not so long. As you line up the vectors a little bit more, it goes again, splitting the difference between them, but it's a little bit longer. And if you get them incredibly close together, again, you split the difference between the vectors, but it's even longer. Of course, if you make them all the way to the exact same direction, then it's just adding them together straight away, just like we did in the first problem, okay? So you already have a really good idea of what vector addition is. So think about this in your mind, that it's not hard and it's not complicated. So what we're gonna do now is I'm going to show you how to, to, uh, how to add vectors together when it's not quite so, like I, I set this up to be very obvious what happens, but now I'm gonna give you randomly, random vectors pointed all weird directions. How do you add those together? This is what you do. The first thing I wanna say is we write vector addition as the following. We write it as the following. Just a couple of quick examples. I've already kind of shown you here. If I'm dealing with force forces, we say the resultant force is equal to F1 plus F2, right? If we're dealing with velocities, we might say that the resultant velocity, because velocities are vectors also, right? V1 plus V2. We've got to keep our bars. I'm going to forget at some point uh, to do that. And then just as another uh, example, I've kind of thrown around electric field. The resultant electric field might be the sum of two different electric fields, E1 plus E2, but they're both vectors, so they add together, right? But in all of these cases, whether it's force, velocity, electric field, or any of the other vectors I told you about, magnetic field, uh, it can go on and on and on with other vectors, velocity vector, I guess we already talked about velocity, acceleration vectors, uh, and there's many, many other ones, right? Most quantities in nature actually are vector quantities. They are different in terms of the variables we label them and all this, and they represent different things, but the vector addition itself is exactly the same because once we know their vectors, they're all treated the same way in terms of how to add them. So let's get down to it and let's figure out how to add these guys. Let me see, do I want to do this? Yeah, I think I want to do this on the next page. What are, yeah, I think I'm going to go ahead and do it here. Let's go ahead and leave this on the board like this. So how to add a general recipe for adding vectors graphically. Okay, step one. You draw the two different vectors, F1 and F2. Got to put my little vector arrows if I remember. F1 and F2. And you draw them in a certain way. You align them up tail to head. I'm gonna show you what that means, don't worry about it. All I'm gonna do is arrange the arrows, tail of one arrow to the head of the other arrow, okay? And then step two is I literally play connect the dots. It's like kindergarten, you get to draw things and all that stuff. You connect tail of F1 to head of F2. So literally, it's like going back to second grade when you get to draw pictures for your math homework. Uh, so this is what's going to happen here. So let's take some simple examples that we understand already. Uh, we're going to take, uh, specifically, we're going to take one really similar to this. I showed you that this made sense intuitively, but let's use our recipe to add vectors graphically, and you'll see how it's done. Let me switch colors here. So let's say that I have some ball here. I'm going to represent it here. So this is a ball. Could be a baseball, golf ball, whatever and I'm pushing up on this ball with a force F1. It's a vector force, right? In length and a direction. And to keep things simple initially, I'm gonna keep F2 the exact same length, but as time goes on, I'm gonna actually have different length vectors also. So F2 is a vector acting on that ball. So this is exactly the very same case as this one. Instead of pulling up and over, I'm pushing up and over. So you know what's gonna happen if I push this ball this way, the ball's gonna fly off in this direction. I'm gonna have a force in, the, in this direction that's gonna exactly bisect this angle. But instead of thinking about that way, we're gonna use our recipe. We're gonna draw F1 and F2 tail to head. What do I mean by that? I mean that these vectors, like F2, you can literally like 
envision grabbing this vector and literally moving it around the board anywhere you want, but you have to keep the vector oriented in the same way that it is initially drawn because it represents a direction that way. So I can move this vector anywhere I want to connect it tail to head to the other vector, but I have to keep it pointed the same way and I have to keep the same length. And also, I can do the same thing with F1. I can grab him and I can move him around the board anywhere I want, but I have to keep him pointing up and I have to keep the same length. So I want to do that. I want to grab these and I want to arrange them tail to head. So the way that it would look is the following. You go from that initial problem to the following thing. I'm going to keep F1 exactly where he is. I haven't moved him at all, so I'm going to call this F1 still. All right? But I'm going to take F2 and I'm going to push him over here. I'm keeping the same length, same direction. I've just moved him. I'm allowed to do that. I can grab and move him anywhere I want, but I'm going to move him tail to head. What does that mean? This is, <clears throat> this is the tail of this vector is the head of the other vector. So I guess I should talk about heads and tails, right? The head of the vector is the, is the arrow part. The tail of the vector is the other part. It, it doesn't really matter. What you really want is you want to, to align the vectors up. So you have the arrow head of one of them touching the tail or the rear end of the other one. And later on, when we have three and four and five vectors we're adding together, you're going to connect them all in this chain kind of thing. But here's the rule. You have to use the same orientation of the original vector. See, this one's connected the, the head of this one to the tail of the other one. All right? And then what's going to happen, I'm going to, just for clarity, I'm going to draw it a third time. You don't have to do this on your paper. But this guy is what we called F1. This guy is what we called F2. Now the third part is we connect the tail of, of F1 to the head of F2. This is the tail of F1, head of F2. So what's going to happen is you literally go over here and you connect the dots from the tail of this one to the head of this one. You draw it and you call this FR. This is the resultant vector. This is the sum of those two. Let's see if it makes sense. We're saying that we add these vectors and what we get is a vector pointed that way with this strength, this, the length of the arrow represents how, how strong it is, the magnitude of it, right? We're saying it's this big, it's bigger than F2, it's bigger than F1 because it's longer, but it's not pointed in that direction at all. It's pointed 45 degrees. That makes total sense. We said that it should be, notice if you take this guy and you mentally move it here, that's exactly what we think should happen, which is exactly what we said would happen in the first case. But this is a recipe that works for any vectors. See here, I chose them like this, but we're going to choose them in all kinds of crazy directions in a second, and the same recipe applies. So let's go and do it uh, one more time. Let's go and say, yeah, I think I have room here to kind of keep going. Let us do it the exact same way. Let me give you the problem statement. So here is, we'll do a little line here to separate everything. So here's a ball. That's a ball, okay? And here we're going to call this F sub 2, same length as before. Okay? But F1, we're going to keep it oriented the same way. However, we're going to make F1 shorter. F1 is now going to look like this. So what do you think is going to happen? Well, obviously I'm pushing it this way and I'm pushing it this way. So it is going to be a mixture of those two. However, F1 is not the same as F2. So mostly the ball should go to the right. It is going to go up some, but mostly it should go to the right. Uh, that should dominate this addition here. Let's see what happens. So we go over here and we redraw everything. However, we're going to take and move things around tail to head. So what I'm going to do is leave F1 alone. I'm going to leave him pointed up. But I'm going to take F2 and move him over here. Notice it's exactly the same thing as before, except F1 is just shorter. And then I'm going to redraw everything a third time just for absolute clarity. Otherwise, I'll, cl I'll clutter everything up. So what's going to happen is you're going to have uh, F1 here. You're going to have F2 over here. The resultant is just literally taking the tail of this vector and connecting the dots to the head of the other one. F resultant. Now look at the arrow that we generated at the end. It's not pointed quite as steeply as that one. Eh, maybe I didn't do quite so good of a job. What I probably should have done, this one should be shorter. Notice this one is shorter, so I'll keep that one shorter too. And then when I draw it, it's going to look like this. This is kind of a little bit closer to reality of what I actually drew over here. Notice that this one is, is pointed more to the right than this one was. Why? Because F2 was bigger, exactly what we predicted. So if we put two forces on a ball like this, we can kind of like 
I mean, I know it looks like a pain in the rear end that we're doing all this vector addition. Why do we care? It's because if we have a ball with two forces, it's really a pain to deal with both of these forces. So what you do in your problem is you add the forces together to find one force. And instead of solving the problem with two forces, you just find this one and deal with one force. So you add them vectorially, right? And you have one single force acting on this ball. So this ball is gonna behave the same if you have two forces acting on it like this, or if you have the exact same ball with one force acting like this, the ball will behave the same because the addition of two vectors is exactly the same thing as what they look like separately as, if they had, uh, as compared to how they look like when you add them together. All right, so let's take another example. Let's say we have a ball. <clears throat> let's put the ball right here. And we're going to have F1 not going horizontal anymore. We're going to call him F1. He's going to go like this. We're going to call this F1 vector. And then also acting on that ball is going to be another vector slightly shorter and at a slightly different angle, F sub 2. So you see, these are kind of lined up, so you know it's gonna, gonna kinda go that direction, but it's a little bit weird because F1 is stronger than F2, so it should dominate a little bit. So you have competing things. You have the directions are different, and you also have the lengths are different. So the way you do it is exactly the same way as all the other cases. You go over here and you redraw everything. So I wanna do tail to head. I wanna draw F1 first, so I'm gonna do my best. Forgive me if it's not exactly right, but F1 is gonna be like this. That's not exactly straight, but it's close enough. And then F2 is going to go up like this. So this could be F2. This is going to be F1. Notice what I did. I left F1 alone. That's what I'm trying to do. I grab F2 with my hand, and I move him up here so it's now connected tail of one to head of the other. Right? So let me go and draw it again. So I have this guy right here, and then this guy slightly shorter up here. This is F2, F1. So what's going to happen? I just connect literally the head of one to the tail of the other, and this is called the resultant. Now, does this make sense? Well, we said that we have a ball here. We're pushing it this way. We're pushing it this way. It should fly off in this direction more or less, which is what we have. And it's larger, much larger than F1 or F2. Well, that's because they're pretty close to being lined up. But you notice how F1's bigger than F2 and all of this stuff you have to take into account. The graphical method handles all of that. You don't have to think about it. It's like drawing hi uh, hieroglyphics, you know, Egyptian hieroglyphics. I mean, it draws a picture and it works out so that the resultant vector takes into account the directions of those initial vectors plus their magnitudes. All right? So this is what the vector addition of those would be. Now, we've been talking a lot about forces because um, forces are easy to visualize. Everybody knows that you push with a force. But we already talked about in the last couple sections displacement. Displacement is a vector also. It has a magnitude, how far did I move, and it has a direction, which way did I move. That's why displacement is a vector. And of course, we already know velocity is a vector too. So let's draw a couple of quick pictures of how we would add a displacement vector. Let's draw just, we don't have to do this, but let's draw a coordinate system just because sometimes it's helpful. So this is, um, this is now x and this is now y. So let's say we're walking from my front porch, which is, this is my front porch, right? This is zero comma zero. This is the, the central part of the thing here. And let's say that I move one, two, three units to the right along x, so it's kind of hard for me to draw it, so I'm gonna kind of draw the arrow a little bit under the axis, even though it really should be right on top of the axis, so you can kind of see them. So I'm gonna call this d1 vector quantity. I've moved along x in the positive direction three units, three meters, let's say, okay? And then, just to kind of help us along here, let me continue the tick marks, we'll continue the tick marks a little bit more in both directions. So this is one, two, three, four. This is five tick marks, and this is like three tick marks or something. All right. So then let's say that, actually, let me go one more. I'm going to go to six right here. Let's say that after that, I'm going to choose a different color. After I walk three units this way, I turn a little bit, and I walk at an angle. So then I'm going to go up to, um, let's see here up, uh, what I'm trying to draw is something like this, up here. Eh, 
not exactly perfect. Pretty close to what I want. I want to get over here to about six, and I want to get over here to about three. All right. So in other words, this is called D2. This is D2 vector. So my question is, if I walk out of my mailbox along x for three units, and then I cock myself at an angle, and I go this far at an angle, this is, this is some angle I haven't given it to you, but it's some angle to the x-axis, what would my resultant vector be? The resultant vector is going to be kind of the sum of those distances. But obviously, those distances are not lined up, so it's a vector sum. I have to take into account the angles involved and the distances traveled, so that I want to know the resultant from my front porch, how how far would it take if I were to walk in a straight line to the final destination? Because here I went out of my way. I went this way and then I went this way. But the resultant would be from A to B, start to finish, as if I, were had, if I would have taken a second trip going in a straight line. How do I add those things vectorially? So you do the same thing as we did before. To add them vectorially, you put them tail to head. Now they're already actually arranged tail to head because it's two trips like this. So what you say is you say, well, D1 is represented by this. And D2, see if I can draw it right, is represented like this. So what is the, um, the resultant of this? Well, I start, they're already arranged head to tail, so then I just start at the beginning of T1 up to T2. Forgive me, I'm trying to connect it over here. And this is uh, what we call the resultant vector. All right? So I walk along D1, walk along D2. That's one trip. I, I arrive at my destination. And then my question is, what is the total displacement, the resultant displacement, start to finish. So I add them vectorially, and that's represented by dr. So before we were talking about forces, adding forces, you can add displacements, and the resultant you get is going to represent the entire trip. Now, when we're talking about walking to my mailbox, let's say my mailbox is over here, okay? The, um, the resultant vector does not depend on path taken. In other words, let's pretend this is my front door, and then at the tip of this, the destination, is the mailbox. That's where I'm trying to go. Now in this path, I chose to walk a little bit down the street, and then turn and cross the street and go up toward my mailbox. That's one path. And my resultant path, my resultant displacement is represented by the blue arrow. Okay? But there are many, many ways to get to the mailbox all will get me to the mailbox. They will all have the final displacement vector. But there are many ways to do it. I could walk a short distance and then cut over sooner. I can walk a much further distance and then cut over much later. I will still get to the mailbox by different paths, but have the same resultant displacement. So let me give you a couple of examples of that. I kind of gave the punchline away a little bit. But let's just say we have, again, the same exact thing. Nothing is different. Um, but let's go ahead and draw, let me go ahead and draw 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 1, 2, 3. Okay. So let's draw our resultant first. The mailbox is basically here. The mailbox is, I really want to get to that mailbox. The shortest path we know is this resultant path, just to cut across the grass, cut across the neighbors, cut across the street, get all the way to the mailbox. And of course, we took a, a different path to get there the last time. But there are other paths we could take. Instead of cutting over here at x is equal to 3, I can cut over here at x is equal to, let's say, uh, 4. And then I, and I call that d1. And then I cut up and I get to the mailbox here. I call this d2. Do you see how d1 and d2 here, they're two different vectors. This one is different because it's longer. And this one is different because it's uh, it's starting from a different point, so it's a different distance and a different direction. But the sum of these two vectors actually gives me exactly the same thing as this thing. Okay, One more quick example to show you what I'm talking about. x, y. Let's do the same thing. 1, 2, 3. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So the mailbox is my destination. The mailbox is basically over here. So let's draw the resultant first. There are many, many ways to get there. So instead of cutting across here, let's go all the way directly across from the mailbox. We'll call that D1. I'll look both ways across the street and I say, okay, I'm going to cross now. I go up, straight up, D2. 
So this D2 is slightly different than this one. It's pointed differently. It's also this one's longer than this one if you get a measurement ruler out. D1 and D D1 in these cases these are obviously different, but the same resultant is the tr is true. So the moral of this story is that for displacement vectors or in general vectors, when you have a resultant there are many, many ways to add to get that resultant. Two vectors can be added differently. The same is true of forces. If I know that I'm pushing a force here on a box with six newtons, and I know that I'm gonna do, you get that force by adding two vectors together, there's an infinite number of two ways I can do that. I can have the two vectors lined up, exactly lined up with half of the force, They'll add up exactly. Or I can cock them at a little bit of an angle and adjust the magnitude so they give me that same force. Or I can cock them at even more of an angle and adjust their magnitudes even bigger to, to give me that same force. Just like I can pick lots of different paths to get to the end. So that's just kind of a lesson that I want you to kind of keep in the back of your mind. And it's also a good practice in vector addition also to kind of see how that works. Now so far we've been talking about forces as a vector. We just talked about displacement as a vector, and I briefly, before we close the section out, I want to talk about velocity as a vector. Nothing changes. Everything's added the same, but th just think about a spaceship. I want you to think about a spaceship in space. I'm not a good artist. That's one thing you're going to figure out during this class. But this spaceship is shaped like a bullet, okay? It's just a pointy end of a rocket and so on. And so velocity is a vector also. It has a magnitude and it also has a direction. So let's say that there's a engine or something like this pushing this thing, giving it a velocity component this direction, V1. But then there's another engine, or maybe you know some other invisible hand or something pushes it and gives it another velocity component in this direction, V2. In NASA speak, you know, I used to work at NASA, we call it delta V, right? How much change of velocity do I get in this direction versus that direction? How's the ship going to behave? I'm giving a certain amount of velocity kick this way, and I'm giving a certain amount of velocity kick this way. It's basically like forces. So obviously this one here is going to dominate the motion, but this one's going to have a, 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 a tendency to push the thing up also. How do we find out what's going to actually happen to the rocket? Well, we add them vectorially, and we're going to do that graphically. So what you do is you take V1 and you leave him alone. You can do it multiple ways, but let's do it this way first. So let's leave V1 alone, draw the same uh, direction, call him V1. V2, we're going to grab him. We can move him anywhere we want. We want to put him tail to head, so we're going to put him over here, like this. This is V2. See, sometimes I get sloppy with my little arrow, so forgive me there. So that's V1 and V2. And now that we've gotten past the kindergarten phase of vectors, I don't have to draw the whole thing again. I have V1, I moved V2 around, and now I'm just going to draw the resultant as having gone from here to here. This is called a resultant vector, like this. Does this make sense? If I have a rocket, push this way with a big force and push, well, I'm, I shouldn't say it that way, with a velocity kick that way and a velocity delta V that way, pushing that way, does it make sense? Well. We're saying the rocket's going to go up at an angle, but mostly it's going to go to the right, which makes sense because it's mostly going to the right, but this is going to cause it to, this is going to reduce a little bit of this velocity motion. That's why the arrow is a little shorter, and it's going to end up trying to push it a little bit up, which is why the, the thing is angled up. This, I think you can convince yourself, makes sense for that situation. So the final velocity that you get is going to be an arrow, let's switch colors. The final velocity you get is going to be an arrow that's going to be something like this. That will be the final velocity of the ship if you add those two velocities together. All right? Now, in this case, I have kept V1 in place and I moved V2 so that it was V1 plus V2. Here's something I haven't taught you now. It doesn't actually matter the order that you add these vectors. You know, just like 1 plus 2 is 3 and 2 plus 1 is also 3, right? So what we say is that addition, for numbers anyway, is commutative. You learn that stuff in algebra or in basic math, okay? It turns out vectors are added commutatively also. So if I, if I take vector v1 and I add it to vector v2, I'm going to get some resultant. But then if I separately take v2 and add it to v1, I'm going to get the same exact resultant. So it doesn't matter the direction I add vectors or the order I add vectors. I get exactly the same answer. So in this case, I arranged it this way. Let me show you another way that you can arrange it. So you get exactly the same answer. So let's do it this way. I'll say, or you can do it like this. 
what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take V1 and I'm going to represent it the same way as I have done here. I'm going to call it V1. But here, instead of taking V2 and putting it over here, tail to head, I'm going to take V2 and I'm going to move him over here. So instead of being on the right-hand side, tail to head, I'm going to move him over here. V2. Notice it's still tail to head. And it is still, in other words, the way you would read this is, this is V2 plus V1. This one was V1 plus V2. Because if you read them, here's tail, here's head, here's head again, or however you want to think about it. You know, you have a little chain here. You have tail, tail, head, like this. So this is tail, head, tail, head, like this. This is V2 plus V1. This is V1 plus V2. I've just basically moved it. The other way was up here. And then I move it down here to still make it tail to head. So when I do that, what do I get? I can still connect V2 plus V1 in this direction. That's going to be the resultant vector. And let's compare them. That's going to give you, essentially, if I've tried to draw it correctly, this is, should be the same length as this. Apologize if it's not. But anyway, it's exactly the same thing that you get. So don't stress out too much on, oh, when I move my arrows around, which one should it be, V1 or V2? It doesn't matter. All you have to do is put them on the paper so it's tail to head, tail to head, tail to head. And then you find that, that open tail, the first one you had, and you connect it to the final uh, head of the other guy, and you'll always get the correct result of vector, no matter how you've arranged everything. Because in the next section, I'm going to give you three and four vectors to add together, and you don't have to stress out about which way to do it. You just arrange them tail to head like a little chain or train, and then you connect them. So what this means is a V1 vector plus V2 vector is exactly the same thing as V2 vector plus V1 vector. This is called commutative. It's the same as 1 plus 2 is equal to 2 plus 1, and that result holds for vectors also. So here we've in introduced the concept of vector addition, graphical vector addition. You can see that it's a powerful tool. But you can also see that you can't really solve physics problems with all of these pretty drawings. I mean, it would just get so cumbersome. So what we're going to do in the next lesson is I'm going to show you how to add three vectors or more graphically. It's the same sort of thing. We're just going to get a couple of uh, practice doing it. But then what we're going to do is we're going to start showing you how to do the same addition without drawing all the arrows. I'm going to show you how to break a vector into chunks and add the chunks together so that you're dealing with numbers instead of these arrows. So this is very good to visualize what's happening, but just keep in mind as we do our problems, we're not going to be drawing a lot of arrows like this. You'll draw some, but you won't be doing it like this over and over and over again. We'll draw an initial picture to find out what's going on, and then we'll show you how to do the calculations to go forward. So follow me on the next section, and we will learn how to add three or more vectors graphically.